Dragon Ball Sparking Zero is one of the biggest anime games Bandai Namco has ever put out. Developed by Spike Chunsoft, who knows the legacy and love that players hold towards the Tenkaichi series, they really went all out with this spiritual sequel. And after putting over 50 hours into this game on PlayStation 5, it's time to tell you all about it. My name is Globku, and this is my review of Dragon Ball Sparking Zero. When you first pick up the game, a lot of it will feel familiar if you've played the Tenkaichi series before. The combo structure is roughly the same, but what constitutes a true combo may have changed. A lot of the old defensive mechanics still exist, but you've got new ones to go with them, like this new combo breaker called Revenge Counter. The game will overall feel familiar, but modernized and with some new features. One of the big changes is to movement, and this is a downgrade in my opinion. You can still use super dashes to move around freely, as well as use the spark dash to get directly behind your opponent, but no longer are you able to just dash for free and cancel those dashes carrying your momentum. This used to be one of the big skill ceilings in Tenkaichi, and to me one of the things that defined the series. Instead, this dash is now replaced by this short dash, which costs one bar of meter and works more like a quick dodge. That said, there is a new mechanic that can be used for approaching the opponent called Vanishing Assault, and depending on the distance you may get in on your opponent's face or directly behind them. Your guard stance still exists, but it's now called Perception, and it's a context sensitive counter-attack that might simply block an opponent's move and quickly punish them, or deflect super attacks if you have enough skill points. Speaking of, skill points are here to replace the old blast stocks, and they're also used for some perception counters as well as the new combo breaker revenge counter, though sometimes it feels like it's not worth using them. For instance, you can stop a revenge counter which costs two skill points with a perception that also costs two skill points. If someone throws a beam at me, I can deflect it for two skill points, but why would I do that if if I can also just dodge them for free in most situations. A lot of this feels like it's for style points alone, which is fine. Tenkaichi isn't meant to be taken seriously all the time, sometimes you just want to be stylish. Other than that, it mostly works the same as Tenkaichi did. Every character has their own melee rush combos with different finishers, they have different key blasts and charge key blasts. Each character has two skills with various costs and effects, from healing your own character to performing an instant transmission that makes the opponent lose their lock on or simply get some buffs for your character. They also have two blast supers each, these are your special moves that cost key and deal a lot of damage, and one ultimate blast which is your most devastating attack and can only be used after you enter sparking mode. Even without the ultimate, sparking mode does give you a lot of advantages like making key blasts bounce off of you and removing the cost for a lot of your abilities as well, like the dashes and the key blasts. And you also get access to new combo options like this violent rush right here. In general, I feel like they did a great job bringing Tenkaichi into the modern age with sparking zero. While I do prefer the movement of Tenkaichi 3, I like the new combo options, the new skill system, Vanishing Assault, Revenge Counter, and overall, it feels like they've made everything much clearer visually, it feels more intuitive. That said, some of these defensive options can feel pointless right now, simply because of the way Super Counter works. Previously, this used to be a combination of buttons that you had to perfectly time. You had a one frame window, and if you missed it, there would be an invisible cooldown that would prevent you from spamming it. Now the window is much bigger, and if there is a cooldown, it is so much smaller. And that makes Super Counters the right combo breaking tool to use about 90% of the time, making the other defensive tools feel useless, especially since they cost resources and Super Counters are free. And if you can react and trigger this vanish battle scenario, this is so much slower than it used to be and goes on for ages. It looks cool the first time you pull it off, but after seeing this a bunch of times, it slows the game down so much and completely breaks its pace. It needed to be a lot faster. That said, these are things that can be patched, unlike Tenkaichi 3, what gets put on disc is not something we have to deal with for eternity, and they have laid a very good foundation to patch the game and adjust it further. So overall, I like the new gameplay changes. And you can play against the CPU or other players with a single character, as well as with a team of up to 5 characters like you previously could. And you can just choose a team of any 5 characters or set up a limit of 15 dragon points per team. Each character has an associated cost, the more expensive the character, the more health and damage they deal. So this limit exists to somewhat balance the different teams. Will you take 5 characters into a match and freely switch between them, giving them time to heal while they're tagged out? Or will you bring an absolute powerhouse and hope they carry you to victory? That's completely up to you. Though personally, I think 5 characters takes way too long, especially 5v5. Even with the DP limits in place, every time you tag, they heal a lot. And so, especially if you're playing online, matches can drag all the way to timeouts, which is never as satisfying as completely beating your opponent. And speaking of characters, this game features a record-breaking 181 
31 playable characters at launch plus one pre-order DLC totaling 182 characters, making it the biggest ever in a Dragon Ball game, at least at launch. It is complete with 19 versions of Goku and 14 versions of Vegeta, sure, but also including some unique character types like characters who can't even fly or giants who lack some of the universal options the others have in exchange for super armor and unblockable dashes. But these are just the basics of gameplay that you will be able to enjoy in every game mode that Sparking Zero offers, starting with Episode Battle. This is the story mode for Sparking Zero, and arguably it's the weakest mode the game has. There are some things Sparking Zero does with its story that I think are just the best the series has ever had, but when it comes to visuals and cutting corners, it definitely has its flaws too. First of all, the story is told from the perspective of eight different characters, so story mode will have different sizes depending on who you pick. The biggest story is naturally going to be Goku's, but in general they all work in a similar way. Most of the story is told through slideshows and image stills, albeit voice acted, we've seen the Dragon Ball story retold in much better ways in the past. But also when it goes into actual cutscenes, the animation feels unnatural, like we're not looking at the same game here that gave us those gorgeous Ultimate Blast animations anymore. And this might be because during story mode, you can switch to first person view during a lot of cutscenes. Translating 2D animation into 3D is a tough challenge, but it's easier to do when you control the camera angle, which is what happens with all the Blast animations. They have a fixed camera that has been crafted specifically for each animation. But if you give players the power to switch perspectives freely, now you no longer control the camera perspective fully, and this 3D animation suddenly doesn't feel like it belongs in the same game. Don't get me wrong, I think if you freeze and take a screenshot at any point, these models look incredible, but when they start moving, something just feels off. This mode covers the Dragon Ball story from the arrival of Raditz to the end of the Tournament of Power, so it covers a lot of arcs. It does skip the Tournament of Destroyers completely, pretending it didn't exist, but the story is told in a very abridged way. This was definitely built for Dragon Ball fans, and it's not a good story mode if you don't already know the events of the show. If you're looking for a game to play through the Dragon Ball story instead of watching the show, my recommendation is probably still Kakarot. Sparking Zero's story is closer to the abridged Tenkaichi 3 rather than the extensive Tenkaichi 2 story if you remember those games. But the battles are somehow not as dynamic as they were back in Tenkaichi 3. There are a few moments where the game will force a transformation or unlock a new move mid-battle, but frankly, those moments do not happen enough to make the whole thing feel as dynamic as it should. On top of it, as a Dragon Ball fan that has played this story countless times in many video games, I do appreciate the abridged nature of this mode, but it still feels like they cut some corners. For instance, Vegeta's story ends with Dragon Ball Z, it doesn't go into Super at all. Gohan's story starts on the Cell Saga, skipping the Saiyans and Namek. I thought I was gonna get a full Trunks experience here, but it's just Trunks from Dragon Ball Super, so no Z story at at all. And honestly, Goku Blacks is so awful, I actually recommend skipping. There is one thing that does make this whole game mode worth it, and that is the inclusion of what if stories. From time to time, you may have a dialogue option that will send you down a different path from what happened in Dragon Ball Canon. Sometimes, instead of dialogue, you have to complete an optional battle objective, like defeating an opponent instead of simply surviving an encounter, or finishing a fight with a specific move. The game does a really good job of giving you a story overview and letting you know exactly where these splitting paths are, so you can always go back and check if you've missed any what-if stories, which you should definitely do, because these are the best what-ifs in Tenkaichi history. They are really, really good. Most of them are just a single scene, and are about defeating one of the big villains sooner than they actually did. It's alright. But others, simply by changing one small thing, send you down a different path that spans multiple sagas. It can go from the Saiyan Saga into Namek, or others that I'm not gonna spoil here. They are way bigger than they ever were before, and they do vary in quality, but I would say each character has at least one what-if story that is definitely worth seeing, except for Goku Black, even the what-ifs are terrible there. These are the reason to play this game mode, and honestly the one reason why you should not skip it, because the retelling of the canon story really wasn't up to the standards of the series or modern Dragon Ball games in general. Luckily, this game has a lot more to do outside of story mode, including more single-player content in the custom battle game mode. 
This is a creative mode, one where you can craft unique battle scenarios, what if stories, or pure fantasies, hard gameplay challenges, or story driven battles. If properly supported, this single game mode can give the entire player base a reason to come back to this game years from now. Something that players usually only do for online versus, but this time, the game provides long term single player content through these encounters crafted by the community. And the whole thing starts with a set of bonus battles, which were actually created by the developers using the same tools that they gave players. These are a set of 30 battles meant to inspire and give you ideas, and you jump into each one completely blind and try to figure it out on the go. But after you beat each scenario, you can inspect its conditions and even copy and change them to make your own scenario with that as your starting blueprint. These battles are fine for the most part, I do wish they got a little bit crazier. Over the course of 30 battles there was plenty of space for that, but unfortunately they do stay pretty basic. As you play this mode you'll also notice that sometimes there's dialogue during the battles themselves. But because this is custom dialogue, none of this is voice acted. And it can be pretty hard to pay attention to the subtitles in the middle of battle. So not only do you miss some potential storytelling here, sometimes that dialogue is a hint on how you need to beat the encounter, and I found it pretty hard to spot sometimes. After you try some of those developer created encounters, you may feel like exploring some player creations. And once you learn how to navigate the world library, you can easily find the most popular encounters that players have made. In general, I found the top picks to be incredibly good, whether they are funny, cinematic, hard, or purely creative, but sometimes you also get an encounter like this, which is pretty much just the creation tutorial, and somehow more than 10,000 people have played it. But you can navigate these menus forever, check out the top picks, find some obscure genius creation, and just browse and enjoy the creations of the community as you please. Or you can create some of these battles yourself. They give you so many tools to make this happen, and it all starts by simply picking which characters you want to feature in gameplay and cutscenes. On the effects menu, you can set various conditions that range from power-ups, transformations, forcing character switching, triggering cutscenes, pretty much every trick you've ever experienced in a Tenkaichi story mode, and more, are available right here. You can even create secret endings if players meet certain conditions, so you could make encounters that end differently depending on how people played it. These effects options are incredible, easy to navigate, and very intuitive. The same cannot be said for the scene editor. This is where you make the game's cutscenes. After picking a cut, you can edit which characters are in it, what are their poses, and their dialogue. The dialogue is where everything falls apart. There are a lot of dialogue options you don't get to type, you get to pick from over 5,000 options they have, and every time you see a word highlighted in green, you can swap that word for another. So there are a lot of options, and that's really good. The problem is navigating these options. Something as simple as finding a character name can take way longer than you'd like because none of this is actually ordered alphabetically, and you can filter the sentences based on some presets they created, but it doesn't always make the job of finding what you're looking for much easier. Dialogue is incredibly hard to browse, it's by far the most time consuming part of this process, and it could be made a lot easier with two simple changes, one, making all these lists alphabetical, and two, adding a search feature. I understand why they simply won't let you type the text you want into these battles, the license holders would never approve that, but allowing players to search for a keyword, and then displaying all the sentences that that feature that word would save so much time and help creators make a lot more battles. Regardless, this is a very unique game mode and one that can keep this game active for a really long time. Sharing encounters is easy via a string of numbers, which makes it look like you could share this across different platforms, though unfortunately this game does not support crossplay. Not even for this game mode, which is unfortunate. With that said, let's look at the rawest Sparking Zero experience, let's talk about versus matches and online. Let's start with training mode. After all, you may want to practice the game before jumping into some PvP, right? Well, the training options this time around, they're not bad. You can set your gauges to max if you want, and then for the training dummy, he can just sit there as you lab some fake combos, or you can set him to do some behaviors which do let you practice some specific scenarios. It's a lot better than many other arena fighters for sure, but if you compare this to fighting games, this training mode is way behind. Jumping into some offline versus, you can play against the CPU with any rule set you want. You can also play CPU 
CPU versus CPU battles if you just want to watch the show, or you can play against a friend offline, though you can only do this through the hyperbolic time chamber, probably due to some hardware limitations, as this is the simplest stage without much destruction going on. Tournament mode is also back, the game comes with some pre-built tournaments for you to try to beat, each one of them giving you a different trophy, or you can make your own custom rules, like character filters, meaning you can only pick certain characters, a rule for no flying, ring outs, and a few others. This time around, tournaments can only have up to 8 characters, but you can actually take them online, custom rules and everything, so you can create a tournament and invite up to 7 friends to join. Speaking of online, this is where a lot of you are going to spend most of your time for sure, and after about a week of testing the netcode, I gotta say, it is really good. It is delay-based netcode, first of all, rollback still hasn't arrived at this genre, but compared to other anime games, I felt a lot less stutter, a lot less delay than usual, even when playing matches from Europe across to the United States. Wi-Fi will still make the game stutter, I don't recommend playing on Wi-Fi by any means, and you do feel the delay, I don't want to paint a picture that this is perfect. When the distance is bigger, you of course will feel your inputs being delayed, but with it being stable, it's something you can definitely adapt to. When you queue for a match online, there are many options, you can create a room for your friends and even spectate each other's matches, which is perfect for hosting events or tournament streams. Or you can queue for matchmaking, solo or DP battle, which means you queue for a battle against a single character or a team battle with a limit of 15 dragon points. You can also set filters for fighting with or without customization items and whether you want a ranked match or a regular unranked match. You can filter by how many connection bars you want at the bare minimum and the completion rate of your opponent, so if they rage quit a lot, you won't find them in queue. Other than that, this is a true ranking system. Up to a certain rank, you will always gain points to encourage you playing more matches online, but starting at B rank, you will actually lose points, making it more of a real representation of skill and less of a grind. Throughout the entire game, you will find a couple of extra features that may or may not influence the other game modes. If you visit Zeno, for instance, you will find an extensive list of missions that can be as simple as playing with a character or triggering some specific dialogue. It's like everything you do in this game can complete a mission, which can reward you with Zeni, which is the in-game currency, or it can also reward you with new customization items for your characters and your player card. If you visit the shop, you will also see some cosmetics here, like character outfits, as well as the characters themselves, and even some cap souls for sale. The truth is, all of these characters could be unlocked for free by completing the right challenge. Some story missions unlock characters, specific tournaments do as well, even bonus battles do it. But instead of doing all that, if you got the Zeni, you can speed up that process by buying everything in the shop. And once you do complete the requirements for unlocking them, the game refunds you the money that you spent buying them. Similarly, the Dragon Balls feel a bit optional this time around. They also unlock things you can find in the shop more often than not, and that's a good thing. While some Dragon Balls are easy to find, because you get them automatically from beating the story mode, for instance. Once those one-time rewards are gone, farming Dragon Balls is something you can only do by playing against the CPU. And sure, you can set it up so you defeat them quickly and get a lot of matches in a few minutes, but this process is pretty boring. We've briefly touched on customization, but like previous games, you can customize characters' outfits, and this time you can complete those outfits with some accessories. But outside some of the main cast, your options are very limited. Goku may have a ton of outfits, but don't expect everyone in the cast to receive the same treatment. In fact, a glaring omission in customization this time around is alternate color schemes. They're just not present. But you can customize way more than that. You can equip capsules, taunts, and even alter the character's behavior if they're being used by the CPU. Finally, we got the encyclopedia, where you can read some details about every single playable character, as well as listen to Chi Chi, Bulma, and Videl give their takes on each one of them as if they were chatting in a podcast. Look at the size of those biceps! Well, uh, good, good to know your son is staying healthy. This game is gorgeous, especially at 4K resolution, and even though I didn't capture it because it doesn't translate very well to YouTube, there is some incredible work done to character auras when you have HDR on. But even without that tech, you can see the game looks great, and it all starts in the menus. I thought they would be clunky given all this animation and transitions going on, but if you're just browsing and not paying attention to the background, it is surprisingly responsive. That said, if you just want to take it in, there's a lot of dialogue here and small animation details to see in the background. It feels like it was crafted with a lot of love. 
love. In game, character models, auras, super effects, they all look fantastic. This is without a doubt one of the best looking Dragon Ball games of all time. And the peak of this look is definitely in transformations, fusions, and ultimate blast animations. The one place where cinematics kind of miss is during story mode, where the animation method was completely different, and suddenly it doesn't look like these characters move like Dragon Ball characters at all. But this game's presentation is more than just the look. The soundtrack is incredible, and there are a lot of unique character interactions, references, and easter eggs during character intros, or straight up during gameplay. For instance, if you use Solar Flare on Master Roshi, it doesn't work, because he has sunglasses. Small details like this were present in the classic Tenkaichi games, and a lot of them actually made it to this one as well, and I'm sure fans like me will appreciate those. With that said, it's finally time to score this game, and if you're new here, we use letters for our review scores from F, which is a really bad game, to A, which is a really good one. And this is my score for Dragon Ball Sparking Zero. Kakarot, it's time we settle this once and for all. Is the story mode good? No. Outside of what if stories, I think it's a mode I could safely skip. Are the custom battles missing some quality of life features? Yes, they are. Looking through dialogue is a pain. Are there gameplay mechanics that feel unintentionally broken and overpowered? Absolutely. Super counter should not be the right answer 90% of the time when other options exist. Sparking Zero is by no means a perfect game, but the overall package is one of the best that we ever got in anime gaming history. The best what if stories the series has ever written. A creative mode that lets fans create their dream scenario and share them with everyone else. A record-breaking number of playable characters at launch and a netcode that actually allows North America and Europe to compete with each other. When most of the issues the game has feel like they could easily go away with a small patch, I think it shouldn't stain the overall score too much. And to be very clear, this is not a score I give with the hopes that the game does get patched in the future. Maybe patches will make it worse. No, this is a score that I give to the game as it is right now. This is a very easy recommendation for me as one of the best Dragon Ball games ever made. This is how you revive an iconic franchise, Tenkaichi finally got the sequel it deserved. And that's my review, but if you have your own opinions, make sure to leave them in the comments below. That way people already know what I think, but they can read what you think as well. And for more Sparking Zero, check out this video right here. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.